We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Phoenix, and you are listening to the Monday Mashup. It's uh, 12.02 here in Central Texas, and the heat seems to have abated for now. There's a big storm brewing down in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Boy, howdy. If you haven't listened to Friday's show and the podcast, go back and listen to it. There's a lot of great information that was brought to the table by Michael Edward and our friend from Michigan, Radchek. So if you have any desire to understand what's going on with the environment in a big way, I highly suggest you go back into the archive and uh, and listen. So the, the Gulf of Mexico, there's supposed to be some uh, hurricane watch happening down there, so we're going to get a little bit of clouds and maybe some lightning and rain here in Central Texas as a result of that. We shall see. Uh, As far as lightning and rain, I think Colorado has seen enough over the past week or so for quite a while. Um, It's kind of a big deal, folks, what's happened up there. If you've seen some of the pictures, it is not pretty. There is some serious damage that's taken place. And not only is there damage, but it's damage that's been done to some of the some of the fracking sites up there. And uh, so we have groundwater seeping into the fracking sites, which means that whatever toxic juices are marinating beneath the surface of the earth in these fracking sites, they can come up now and get back into the groundwater, which could be absolutely devastating for the people of Boulder. And I love Boulder. I know quite a few people there. Uh, I have a strong connection with the place from a spiritual level, energetic level. It's a beautiful city. And uh, Guy MTV is based in Boulder. And I know a lot of people there. So this is uh, not not a good thing. It's also, by the way, one of the hubs for the medical marijuana industry, believe it or not. Yes, indeed. Boulder has been on the cutting edge of this since before the legalization of marijuana occurred in uh, Colorado. I was there in 2000 and, what was that, 2011, 2010. I was there in 2010. And... um, Yeah, uh, I saw I saw firsthand in 2010 people that were actually planning 
for what was going to take place. So we had uh, grow centers and all kinds of uh, uh, hot houses and all, you know, I mean, there were some serious people getting involved on the ground level prior to legalization. I don't know what's happened to their uh, operations, but I can tell you that if they were not secure, uh, if they were not above a certain height in terms of the groundwater, in terms of the flooding, and we're in the flood zone, they're cooked. And not only are they cooked with whatever crop they're working on, but you know if some of the fracking juice has gotten into the groundwater, then they might be done for quite a while. Is this deliberate? I don't know. You know, there tends to be some thought on the uh, alternative radar, alternative research radar, that this was a harp job. Wouldn't surprise me at all. Wouldn't surprise me in the least. Last year, uh, Boulder had fires, terrible fires. You have to ask yourself, why is this fairly enlightened community being targeted, especially in what I would call the heart of liberal America? It doesn't make much sense on some level. Perhaps these disasters are just natural, and I'm just a paranoid nut job living in Austin. But there tends to be some kind of cyclical reparation, smoting the hand of God on Boulder. Maybe the uh, Christian conservatives will point towards the legalization of marijuana in all their liberal ways as a result of this. I don't think so. Syria is on the back burner for now. It can always be moved to the front burner where things are hotter and they can cook up a recipe for conflict and engagement. Now, what the Soviets did, the Soviets, the Russians, are they still Soviet? I don't know. They, they, they claimed to have a free market economy. But uh, what the Russians did was pretty brilliant, and they pounced upon a verbal mi uh, misstep by John Frankencarry. And essentially, and some of you already know this, uh, Frankencarry said, hey, look. We might back off if we could get them to hand over their chemical weapons. <laughs> that chance they'll do that. <laughs> but it sounds good. Sounds really good. We have to sound somewhat enlightened, somewhat progressive. Yes, we're tolerant masters. So we have to say something like that. We, let's give them an out. But that out really isn't an out because nobody will take it seriously. Oh, guess what? It didn't work. Mr. Lavrov said, hey, you've got a great idea there. We can help you on that. We can broker a deal. And Charlie's like, oh, what, 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 well, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah, well, but uh, there's problems with that because how can we really trust them? Well, don't put it on the table if you're not willing to go the distance. You open your mouth, I'll do the deal. So they've got 30 days to somehow put together all of their chemical weapons. Now, the whole idea of chemical weapons, I've been wanting to talk about this. It is such a chimera, you know? It's just like there are social taboos that are out there. Chemical weapons is one of them. Uh, child abuse is another, uh, what else? Landmines could be another. These are, these are Rubicons in our society. And for good reason, especially with children, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, minimize child abuse. It's, it's rampant. It's terrible. And it goes very deep in areas and ways in which most people don't want to know and are not willing to, to understand. But with chemical weapons, there is this sanctification of somehow that it's worse 
to use chemical weapons to kill people than other weapons to kill people. I mean, it makes no sense in some ways. Killing people is killing people. It doesn't really matter. It's just a ruse. It's just a chimera. It's just a Rubicon, an artificially created red line in the sand Rubicon that is used to justify retaliation and an act of war. Because, because theoretically, regular conventional weapons with shrapnel or uh, hollow points, those reasons aren't good enough. We need to have something really sexy to go to war. And it's chemical weapons. Death is death, okay? It's death. No matter how you slice it or dice it, it's death. And where did they get the chemical weapons from? If they even had them, if they even used them, everything points towards the butchers that are considered the uh, liberators of Syria with them having the chemical weapons. But even if we play by the company script, how'd they get them? Who'd they get them from? Where'd they buy them from? Well, it's pointing towards the British that sold them the chemical weapons or the Germans, one of the two. They had to get them from somewhere. If they didn't get them from evil China or evil Russia, then they had to get them from one of the NATO nations. Why is the NATO nation selling Syria chemical weapons in the first place? Why? Because it makes them money. That's why money, money, money. They don't give a shit. Again, it's just a, an excuse. That's all it is. It's been used before on a number of occasions. Just an excuse. Chemical weapons are no different than any other weapon. And by the way, I know people bring this up, but it's worth repeating that if you look at depleted uranium and what it's doing, it, by the way, is technically a chemical weapon and it's being used all the time in places like Iraq, Libya, Syria. Yes, depleted uranium is being used in all those places. My friends, that is a chemical weapon. And it is absolutely killing people and distorting the DNA in those areas of, of lives and communities and families for generations to come. It's a chemical weapon. Genetically modified organisms, guess what? They're a chemical weapon. They are in our food and they attack us. You know, they now theoretically, this is what's funny about genetically modified organisms and the weird gray area that they're in. You see, they may put in something that is synthetic inside of a genetically modified organism, i.e., a kernel of corn or tomato. Most of the time, what they're inserting could even be classified as organic. But you don't go mixing frog genes with a tomato gene or, or corn gene, or you don't go mixing spider genes with a corn gene. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, it might be natural, but it's like a weird natural. It's like it's, it's, like it's unnatural. So it's in this strange zone of not being natural and not being set synthetic. It's in this kind of you know, third column, which is strangely unnatural. That's not to say that there would be chemicals or something synthetic inside of a genetically modified organism. Now, that said, they are doing the same thing that a bioweapon would do to us. They're killing us. Genetically modified foods are killing us. How many people do you know are having problems with their stomachs? Raise your hand. If you can't digest food, if you have IBS, if you have any of these things, why is that taking place? Well, it's probably taking place because they've actually nailed it down to genetically modified foods that are screwing with your, your GI. And it creates bloating and all kinds of uncomfortable things for, for humans. 
So a genetically modified organism is theoretically a chemical weapon. Fluoride in the water. Yeah, that's right, fluoride in the water. And by the way, if they did actually use gas there, there are some people that believe it was fluoride gas that killed those people. Fluoride gas. And we have it in our water. That's right. It's in our water. It's been in our water for years. And what does it do? Well, first of all, it stunts the growth of your pineal gland, and it helps. It helps, <laughs> not in a good way. It assists in the accumulation of metals inside the body. Yes, it does. It acts as a receptor, like a magnet to metals. Now, there are people that believe that fluoride, in conjunction with aluminum, and aluminum is everywhere. It's everywhere. It's in, in our cans and our TV dinners. You name it, there's aluminum. And so aluminum, in conjunction with fluoride, can cross the brain blood barrier, and thus we have diseases like MS, ALS, Parkinson's, and ultimately Alzheimer's, dementia. It's a chemical. It's in our water. Now, people say, oh, fluoride is naturally occurring. Yes and no. It's different. The type of fluoride that is extracted from aluminum is just slightly different than the type of fluoride that is naturally occurring in nature, and by the way, the amount of fluoride that occurs in nature or in the natural amalgamation of water is not nearly as close as the intense saturation of fluoride in drinking water. So there we go. There's another chemical weapon. Thalites. Does anybody know what a thalite is? Raise your hand if you do. Thalites and plastics. BPA. BPA is a thalite. What does BPA do? BPA messes with your sex chromosomes. That's right, messes with your sex chromosomes. It makes men produce more estrogen and less testosterone and the reverse for women. And phthalates are everywhere. They're everywhere in our system due to plastic, plastic bottles, everywhere. Now, there's been some consciousness and awareness around this. So you, you can go to a store now and you can buy plastic bottles without BPA, theoretically sans phthalites. And that's a good thing. So, you know, maybe we've redeemed our plastic. But again, it's another chemical that has been... Um, introduced into our system. So let's just do a quick roll check here. We've got fluoride, right? We have uh, genetically modified organisms. We have phthalates. What about over-the-counter prescription, or no, not over-the-counter, what about prescription drugs? If you've ever watched any amount of TV, and by the way, I highly suggest you shit can your TV. Every day, I, I don't even watch TV that often. The only time I watch TV, by the way, is when I want to watch a football game. So I get a kind of a dose of what's going on with America with commercials and TV shows whenever I watch a football game. And it's, it's not good. It is just not good. The programming is... Uh, soul warping is absolutely soul warping. In the second half of the show, in the last half hour, I'm going to I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to talk about something that's slightly controversial, you know. And I hope it doesn't step on too many toes. It's just a notice, but it's kind of a, an important notice on my part. At least I think it is. Not everything I think I notice is important. By the way, I have a pretty good filter. So we have these drugs, these prescription drugs for everything from toenail fungus to erectile dysfunction to lazy, what is it, lazy leg or anxious leg. There's one for uh, 
falling asleep at work. There's a falling asleep drug. You know that that's a, it's an upper. It's it's a variation of modafinil, which they give to kids who have ADD. There is over-the-counter drugs for eczema, over-the-counter drugs for sweatiness, high blood pressure. You name it, there is something that they're willing to sell you for any condition perceived or real that you might have. And then you get into the disclaimers. And the disclaimers are so surreal that you just shake your head by what these people are saying at about a rate sped up by about, I don't know, 50%. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Taking this drug to lead to insomnia, depression, suicide. If you have thoughts of killing another person with an ax, please call your doctor immediately. I mean, you know, this is what you get with these things. It's crazy. It's another chemical. It's another chemical or a series of chemicals. It's not just a chemical. It's like a freaking army of chemicals. I can just see kind of a, you know, there was this movie a few years back, way back. It's called Allegro Non Tropo. I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful film. It's a... Uh, Directed by a Spanish director, I believe he's Spanish, Allegro Non Tropo. And it's kind of a Disney esque animation with really great classical music, although it's a little more out there and surreal than Disney, if you can believe that. But I could just see kind of a Disney esque version of like over the counter drugs, these pills marching, you know, kind of in line, walking, you know, walking towards the battlefield, all these pills, you know. This onslaught of these little tiny, you know, pawns, encapsulated pawns. Anyway, that's another drug that's in our system. So here we go. We have prescription drugs, some over-the-counter drugs. We have fluoride. We have phthalates. We have genetically modified organisms. What else is there? There's all the preservatives that are in our food, the monosodium glutamates, all that stuff, dextrose, dextrose sugar, high fructose corn syrup. You know, I, I tell you, man, I, I my kid's going to have a complex, I think, because whenever we go to the store, it says, can I get this? And I look at it, I look at the label, I said, no. And he goes to another thing, can I get this? No. And by the time I get to the third no, he's about ready to have a meltdown. You know, I'm probably going to give him a complex because I don't want the kid drinking high fructose corn syrup drinks. It's just not in the life plan. I'll let him have one every now and then. Why? Because I don't want him to rebel with something harder in his teenage years. So I let him have a Sprite every now and then. Just the way it is. But we have all these preservatives in our foods and our drinks. So it's another form of chemical inundation and being uh, literally in this, uh, this vat of chemicals. We're surrounded by them all the time. And I haven't even gotten to chemtrails or pollution or China or Fukushima or the crap that's coming up from the Gulf. I'm just looking at really basic and fundamental stuff that we have to deal with besides the horror show of chemicals that we're constantly being bombarded with. And then we sit here as a country and we point the finger at whoever did what they did in Syria and say, shame on you. Shame on you. You've resorted to chemical weapons. Now you must pay the ultimate price. While we here are constantly being uh, assaulted by, chem by chemical weapons. Who stands up for us? Or, as I mentioned before, the people in places like Iraq or Libya, and now probably Syria, who are dealing with depleted uranium, 
Who's going to stand up for them? Nobody. Nobody. Well, some people are. But it's not the big sexy. Trust me. It's just not the big sexy. So anyway, there's my rant on chemical weapons and how disproportionate and um, hypocritical the stance is on them. But for now, Syria is on the back burner. Oh, and guess what? Would just like, you know, clockwork, guess what they're talking about now? They're talking about Iran. Remember how Iran was the big topic of discussion? Oh, they're evil. Oh, they have nu- the nuclear reactor. Da, 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 da. Oh, this. Oh, that. We got to get it right. We got to get it right. We got to get it right. And there's BB Net and Yahoo. We must strike. For the good of the region, we must strike and take down the nuclear threat that is Iran. You know, I mean, you didn't hear that for the last month or so. Well, now that we're sort of diverting our attention from Syria because there's been a little bit of uh, diplomatic judo that's taken place. Well, now we start talking about Iran. Oh, that that bad country. Remember them? Here, let's jerk your attention over here. It was over here. Jerk it over here now. And it's jerked around. That's all people are. They're jerked around. Oh, we had a shooter in Washington, by the way. Another shooter. Supposedly there was a second shooter, but you'll never probably hear anything more about that. So now that we have pushback on Syria, people have said no. Now we get to deal with the domestic BS again. Isn't life great? Isn't life wonderful? We are we're in a constant state of vigilance. Constant now, but we're we're making up for it. Why? Because the constant state of vigilance, which we should have had about 35 to 40 years ago, has been or was uh, placated. People made money. People had jobs. People had lives. People had vacations. People were shooting for that second car, that second TV, that second college education for their kids. Some of those things aren't bad. Second college education may not be bad. depends on what you study. I went to college. I thought it was great. I thought some of college was was shit, to be honest with you. I'll never forget one time I was in junior college and I was studying television. Television broadcasting, that was my thing. I was somehow going to be in TV. Why? Because I've watched so much damn TV my entire youth. I thought, well, this just makes perfect sense. I may as well just translate all the all that study time into a career by watching TV. So I got into TV production and broadcasting. I did pretty well, actually, believe it or not. Uh, but I had this one teacher. He was not a, a broadcast teacher. He was my English teacher. He was a different kind of guy, trust me. Uh, he was, you know, kind of this long hair sort of, how would you describe him? Uh, he, he had, this guy had energy. I don't even remember his name. I think his name was Dave something. He had energy, though. And I liked what he wrote. Although now that I think about what he wrote, he wrote about this car accident one time. And from what I could gather, he kind of copped Jim Morrison's story about watching this car accident when he was a kid. It's a famous Jim Morrison story. You know that story? Jim Morrison sees this car accident on the road. I think they're on their way to California. Uh, the, no, they weren't on their way to California. They were on their way to Arizona or someplace like that. And it was a car accident, and there were some Indians involved, Native Americans. Don't, I love the term Indian. And the spirit uh, of one of them left and attached itself to Morrison. Anyway, that's the story. So this guy, was a, uh, he was a writer. He was actually a screenwriter in Hollywood as well as an English teacher. Some of the great shows that he had written for were The Brady Bunch, or was The Brady Bunch. So he asked me one day, so uh, what do you you want to do? You know, I was like totally confident. Well, I want to get into TV, maybe do some broadcasting, some producing, some writing. And I'm in the uh, program here. And he looked at me and said, you know, you know, 
you'll never get into TV here. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, uh, if you really want to get into TV, here's what you do. You quit school and you go to Los Angeles and you become a page on The Tonight Show. I'm like, what? Yeah, you just quit school, go to L.A., somehow become a page on The Tonight Show, and that's how you break in. Because you'll never do it here. This place is so far removed from anywhere. I'm like, well, that's interesting. And you know what? He was probably right. He was probably right. But I didn't, and I went through school, and some of it was good, and some of it was not so good. And I'll treasure the good parts always. Okay. It's uh, 1230 here in Austin, Texas. I'm going to play some music. When I come back, uh, we will continue the rantings and the ravings of yours truly today. And uh, we'll get into some of the things that I'm actually noticing on TV, which uh, you might be interested in. You never know. Okay, who do I want to play today? How about, uh, you know, I just keep playing these tracks. I have no idea what they are, but it's okay. Um, Let's see. How about... uh, That's too long. Okay, do that, do that, do that. Hold on. Uh, How about... You know what? I still really like this track. It's a one splendid buzz. This is Man Call Clay. Uh, that's too long. I like it though. Let's do let's do a little Roddy Montrose, Town Without Pity, three minutes sixteen seconds. Gene Pitney classic turned into a uh, pseudo pop jazz masterpiece by the late Mon- Ronnie Montrose.
Ah, the late, great Ronnie Montrose. I hope you're in a better place, man. <coughs> Excuse me, Ronnie committed suicide about uh, two and a half, three years ago. And um, if you uh, ever want to explore his guitar work, there's lots of albums out there and documents, audio documents of just how good he was. And uh, the first Montrose record, in my mind, um, is still to this day one of the best rock and roll records ever, period, end of story. Sammy Hagar on vocals, Ronnie Montrose on guitar. So it's been an interesting weekend. Uh, my son's baseball team played yesterday. And uh, we had a really good practice on Friday night. We're in the cage. We have batting cages here. We hit pretty well on Sunday before the game. We got out there in the game on Sunday, and my kid just happens to be the Pisces that finds the crises. I think there's an interesting connection between Pisces and crises. So last year, my kid was, uh, he was dealing with his emotions, anger, frustration. And especially when it came to some kind of social injustice within the framework of the game itself, being called out on a third strike, the ump making a bad call, whatever that was, it seemed to happen to my kid. Now, it happened to a few other kids, but it seemed to happen to my kid the most. And, of course, my kid is the one kid who has the borderline capacity because he wants to win so bad and do so well that his tiny little eight, nine-year-old heart and emotional body can barely deal with the fact that he got screwed over. Sometimes uh, it's his own kind of Piscean imagination and the uh, the Piscean martyr syndrome, which takes place, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but it happened yesterday. And, of course, I've made this big admonition to the kids that they don't cry on the team. And what happens? Well, my son strikes out, but the catcher drops the ball. In baseball, you get to run to first. The catcher drops the ball. Catcher throws the ball to first, and the first baseman gets pulled all the way off the bag. My son, theoretically, should be safe. Even my first base coach, my assistant coach, was flabbergasted that he wasn't safe. And then what happens to my kid? The tears start to come. And guess what he has to do the next inning? He has to pitch. So now my, you know, my thing is I'm going to take the kid out of the game, any kid out of the game, if they cry. But I really can't because I've set my lineup and my kid has to pitch. He's warmed up. He's ready to go. So now I have to make some very quick decisions in real time. So I sit him on the end of the bench until he gets his head together. The kids go out, they start doing infield, you know, boom. He's not perfect, but he's better. And he gets on the mound and he's angry. He's throwing angry. <laughs> I'm sorry, he was throwing angry, but that's sports. It happens sometimes. But he did okay. He did okay. The team was, eh, it was okay yesterday. We had some, we had some good moments. We had some not so good moments, but you know what? It's baseball. They're learning. But I tell you, I am really done playing during the hottest time of the freaking day. We've had two games back-to-back -back on Sundays. We're playing at 3 o'clock. Now, if you've been here in Texas, you know that the hottest time of the day is between basically 1 and 7. Those six hours are brutal, absolutely brutal. Now, theoretically, we should be having some 5 o'clock games. We should be having some 1 o'clock games, even some 11 o'clock games. But this, this 3 o'clock stuff, two weeks in a row. I remember one point, I was standing out there, and I was watching the action, which was very slow, by the way. And I'm watching the action, and I'm thinking, it's hot. I'm thinking, why am I here? <laughs> I was like, why am I here? It was really kind of this really surreal moment. It was like, why am I in this moment? Why am I so damn hot? Why am I watching the baseball game that's going so slow? What am I what am I learning from this? What am I trying to prove to myself, you know? And I was like, okay, that lasted about ten seconds and 
and moved on. But it was just one of those things that happens, you know. You you sort of catch yourself, no matter where you are, what you're doing. I even do it with the show sometimes. What am I doing here? Why am I doing this? Is this real? Does it really matter? You know, and then I pull myself back. I think we all do that from time to time. You kind of, kind of test the reality, the friction of the reality of this of this life and this experience that we're in. But anyway, it turned out okay. There's always next week. I did not leave on a high, but I did get my kid to stop crying. All right, so we were talking about Syria. We're talking about Iran. We're talking about chemical weapons. I went into the chat room. I saw a few other things that people wanted to remind me about. This is the antibiotics and some of the other stuff that is starting to show up in milk and has been for a while. I, I totally forgot about vaccines. Yet another chemical weapon. This whole idea of chemical weapons is such bullshit. You know, we are being inundated with chemical weapons all the time. We are under attack, not even close. Not even close. And that is one of the deep ironies and hypocrisies of our society. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Chuck Helmick. Chuck, congratulations on uh, the finding of your granddaughter. I'm glad that it worked out. You know, you see these things on Facebook every now and then. You see somebody post something and a child has gone missing. And you just go, oh, man, that just sucks. Absolutely sucks. And then you say, well, what can you do about it? Well, Chuck did that. Chuck is a friend, friend of the show. Uh, he's actually, you know, called in one day, I think it was about two weeks ago, on uh, the Wednesday show, and he posted something about his granddaughter having gone missing. And so I went to work on trying to find out just psychically, you know, where he could get some information around this. And um, Sarah Nash jumped in as well. And between the two of us, we didn't really know this, but we kind of tag teamed on this. And um, looks like we made a difference because Chuck's granddaughter was found. And uh, I don't know the full details, only what, what uh, Chuck shared, but uh, Sarah was able to actually come up with the name, the last name of the boyfriend. That is, uh, in terms of psychic work, that is just a freaking bullseye right there. So she came up with the last name of the boy. Uh, I saw in my mind's eye a uh, root beer stand, hot dog stand, hamburger place, kind of a drive drive through thing. Um, and I saw it in my mind's eye, and I went on the Internet, and uh, I found what, uh, what I was looking for in the place where Chuck's granddaughter lives. It, was, it matched up pretty well with what I was seeing. And I sent Chuck uh, that, uh, that image, and I told him to have somebody go down there and post pictures uh, of his granddaughter, and his daughter actually did that at that place. And within hours, um, she got a call from her grand from her daughter. And they'd gone to the boyfriend's house three times with the police, and all three times, uh, the boy did not let the police in. Now that is one ballsy boy. Let me tell you, not only is he ballsy, but he's got uh, he's got some knowledge of the law and maybe some friends in high places. Because after the third time, there are some places that would have kicked the damn door down, would have asked questions later, would have brought the SWAT team. But apparently, uh, the police force in Ohio, in a certain city in Ohio, still remembers the Constitution. So between uh, the root beer stand, hot dog place, whatever that place was that I saw, and Sarah's naming of the name, we put it together, and the daughter, Chuck's granddaughter, is now home. Congratulations, Chuck. Well done, Sarah. That was extremely good work. Direct hit. Kudos to you. And uh, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but also let's just say that it could have been worse. It could have been moving in the direction that might have been worse for the young woman. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something I've been noticing, and this is just a notice, and, you know, it may be 
really controversial and if it sounds like I am crossing some racial lines, uh, it's only a notice. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a notice. That's all. That's all it is. And we have the ability to notice. Right? Question mark? Anyway, uh, in one of the rare moments I'm watching TV, I'm seeing a new show that's coming out in the fall. Well, it's not really a new show. In fact, TV isn't really doing anything new anymore. They're just recycling ideas. But the show is Ironside. Now, who remembers Ironside from like the 60s and the 70s? Who remembers Ironside? I thought it was one of the most ridiculous fucking shows I've ever seen. It was just ridiculous. You know, the 60s and the 70s were the, that was the time where they had the strange, uh, impaired, disabled detective syndrome. You know, you had Ironside uh, in the wheelchair, right? You had, uh, remember Longstreet? A very short-lived series, which, by the way, Bruce Lee was on for a brief period of time. Longstreet was uh, James Franciscus, and he was blind. So he had a blind detective. They brought back Longstreet, by the way. They tried that one again. That didn't really work. That was about four or five years ago. So you had Longstreet, the blind detective. You had uh, Ironside, the wheelchair-bound detective. You had Cannon, who was the fat, overweight, sweaty detective. You had Barnaby Jones, who was the, uh, the, the silver set, the octogenarian detective. So you had all these detectives that were like, you know, I don't know. It must have been a Neptune thing at that time. You know, it must have been a Neptune sort of compassion thing. Let's find somebody who really has a major disadvantage and cast them in the light of a hero. Anyway, Ironside is back. And um, instead of if Ironside was, Ironside was played by Raymond Burr, who also played Perry Mason, famous, well-known actor. He had his own island. He was one of those guys that could afford an island. He had his own island, his own tiny island. He raised pineapples on that island. I think he ran around in dresses, too, just like Marlon Brando. But anyway, Raymond Burr played Ironside. Now, Raymond Burr, again, you know, I am not Tim Robbins. Uh, Raymond Burr was white. He was a white guy. He was Caucasian. Now, Ironside is being portrayed, this time, by an African-American, a black male actor. Now, that's not a big deal, right? But if you kind of notice different shows, like, for instance, Wild Wild West, the movie played by Will Smith, the original actor, Robert Conrad, it was a connection of a different complexion. Uh, Nick Fury played by Samuel L. Jackson. In comic books, Nick Fury was, he was not Samuel L. Jackson. And, you know, it kind of goes on. Well, another one, uh, I Am Legend, Will Smith, playing the Omega Man. It was Charlton Heston, who was originally Vincent Price, the last man on earth, both of whom were Caucasian. So there's this kind of reformatting of these shows and these movies and these characters it's almost like history, in some ways, is being rewritten. It's interesting. I'm just watching it. Okay, I am watching it. I'm not making a judgment. I'm just watching it. I'm making an observation. But what's also fascinating is that there is a film a few years back. It came out in the 90s. It's called White Man's Burden. And it's with Harry Belafonte and John Travolta. And, uh, by the way, my ex-girlfriend at that time... Uh, was working at a hotel, the Lowe's, in Santa Monica, and she waited on that entire cast and crew. She said Harry Belafonte was the nicest dude she'd ever waited on or met. Left her a significant tip. 
John Travolta, eh, she said he was okay. But she couldn't say enough good things about Harry Belafonte. Another guy she loved was Gregory Hines. She said that Gregory Hines used to come in there with Christian Slater and Tom Arnold, of all people, and they used to hang out at the Lowe's and drink. And she said that uh, Gregory Hines was the coolest guy. I like Gregory Hines. He was Aquarius. How could you not like Gregory Hines? But anyway, so White Man's Burden, the film, the story, the plot line of White Man's Burden, set in the future, everything is flipped. The ruling elites are now African Americans, and the uh, underclass living in the inner city and the ghettos are occupied by the Caucasian slash white Anglo-Saxon race. And I'm not saying that we are at that point. But when I, what I witnessed with the VMAs of Miley Cyrus seems in some ways to reflect what's happening in terms of how this vector is being portrayed both cinematically and via television. Because here we have Miley Cyrus, who is kind of in some ways the epitome of what I would call um, elevated white trash. And there she is. She's really making a spectacle of herself on the VMAs. And, of course, the, the meme that was circulated via the Internet was the Smith family aghast. Even though they weren't really aghast at Miley Cyrus, they were aghast at Lady Gaga. doesn't matter. They put the two images together. And so the Smith family became like the Cleaver family, really, in that – in that frame, in that meme, in that reframe. So we're seeing something very interesting taking place. Again, it's just a notice. I'm not making any judgments, but it's definitely an interesting notice. Now, if you look at TV, reality TV, and I, I, I had a, a, a brief little uh, exchange with one of my uh, one of the readers who I love dearly. Andre, who lives up in Detroit, and we talked about this. And Andre is on the uh, media tip in a big way. We talked about this uh, script flipping that's going on culturally. And, it, and it's, it's part and parcel, by the way, of everything. It's not just this one area, right? It's like Russia's the good guy. The United States are the bad guy. Russia's enlightened. The United States kind of warmongering and regressive. I mean, there's all kinds of other areas that I could probably just reach out and, and pull from. You know, gay is the new straight. Straight is the new gay. Gay is the new norm. Straight is abnormal. Man, if you're straight, you're screwed up. Look at you. Your your divorce rate is through the roof. You know, your religions are corrupt. They practice pedophilia. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? There's a whole – it's not just one thing. Everything is just shifting and turning and becoming this kind of, you know, dualistic – you know, my asthma with this um, kind of, you know, geo sort of emotional political pull shift that's going on. Last night I was watching the football game and you should, I think it's a Lexus commercial. It's, they're worth finding. There are two Lexus commercials that are in circulation and you can learn a lot about what's going on in society from commercials. People may diss commercials. People may hate commercials. But, man, you can put your finger on the pulse with commercials. Trust me on this. And there's a commercial that Lexus is running, and it's all about black and white imagery. Black and white. It's this collision of duality. Collision. And it's not just the color scheme, although the color scheme is very important, but it's the imagery as well. I highly suggest you find these two Lexus commercials. They're fascinating, and it gives you kind of a sense of the occult cultural milieu that we're in right now. This is not this is not business as usual, ladies and gentlemen. It's just not. We're in a very different time, and the uh, the moorings, the cultural moorings, are very displacing. So it's all you know. It's it's all part and parcel of the big picture, the great work, the big plan. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. There was something else I wanted to share with you. Was it a commercial piece? Oh, 
Yeah, I think that's about it along those lines. I mean, I was going to talk about Duck Dynasty. I was going to talk about, you know, Swamp People, Alligator Boys, you know, uh, Trailer Park Tarts, whatever. You know, this is kind of the new reality TV, the, you know, Moonshiners. Uh, you, you know, this is the new reality TV that portrays the uh, Anglo-Saxon or Caucasian race in a very interesting, earthy light, shall we say. Right. This is this is how it's being. This is the reality message, the reality TV message that we're being shown, and it's basically south of the border, and it's like you know, hey man, these people are, you know, they're bumpkins, but they're good people. They're good folk. Anyway, just to notice, that's all it is. Um, I honor every single person on this planet, and the God they're in. But I just, uh, on, a, on a cultural programming level, I just, every now and then, I just have to bring it up. That's all. That's all. Okay, Wednesday, we're going to have uh, Rob Tillett on here. And Rob Tillett is one of my favorite astrologers, astrology.com. Right? Is it astrology.com or is it astrology? I'll find Rob's website. I think it's astrology.com, by the way. He owns that website. Uh, he puts up horoscopes every day, and he is the king of the fixed stars. And we're going to talk about fixed stars. We'll talk about Pluto Direct and some other stuff coming up here uh, in the skies. Uh, I have to pre-record that because Rob and I are in very different time zones. But he's going to be on Wednesday. And then on Friday, Carrie Otis, Beauty Disrupted. We're going to talk about her, her book, and also Freeman Fly and uh, Jamie Hanshaw. His partner, we're going to talk about uh, programming, MK Ultra, all that stuff. So Friday should be a very interesting and thematic show. And that's about it. That's about it. Okay, so we are in September. We're entering the funnel now. We are deep in the funnel. We've got October surprise and November digestion to go through. And uh, hang in there. Hang in there, everyone especially you folks up in Boulder, Colorado. You guys take care of yourselves and stay dry and try to get it together and uh, stay out of the FEMA camps. <coughs> <coughs> this is Robert Phoenix. You've been listening to the Monday Mashup. Uh, use your head to discern what's real, your heart to sip and what's possible. I'll see you on Wednesday with Rob Tillett. Take care of yourselves. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.